This is uh, ending the nuclear nightmare. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, if you don't know, I'm David Swanson. I'll be moderating. I'll be introducing Marie Braun and Bonnie Erfer and Ellen Thomas uh, in that order. Uh, the bios are, are important, but a little bit lengthy. I'll give you one at a, at a time as we get to our speakers. So Marie Braun will be first. She lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's a longtime peace and justice activist and has been a member of WAM, Women Against Military Madness, for 35 years, which is, I believe, the life existence of WAM, so founding <laughs> member. Uh, following a trip to Iraq in 98, she became involved in grassroots organizing against the sanctions, and uh, they're back again, uh, and later against the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria, only those ones, and, and in protesting, and others. and others, and in protesting many other U.S. threats of war. Marie was awarded the Activist of the Year Award by the Minnesota Alliance for Progressive Action, MAPA, in 2003, and more recently received the Augsburg College Courageous Woman Award. She, together with her husband John, also received the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Peacemakers of the Year Award, and the Vincent L. Hawkinson Peace and Justice Award. She is currently spearheading the WAM campaign to ban nuclear weapons as in, and is involved in several local Peace and Justice Coalitions. Marie Brock. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, some of you have prob probably know as much about this as I do, but I will go ahead and give my spiel anyway. Um, on August 19, August 6th of 1945, an American B-1 bomber, the Enola Gay, took off from Tinian Island with a 12-member crew. It was carrying the most destructive weapon the world had ever known, an atomic bomb that when unleashed over Hiroshima, Japan, immediately killed from 60 to 140,000. It's interesting, it's such a broad span. They don't know how many you killed. And injured 100,000 more. Three days later, the US dropped another bomb, this time on Nagasaki. Again, the immediate aftermath was a nightmare. The decision to use these weapons changed the course of history. And for more than seven decades, the world community has lived under the threat of nuclear annihilation. People the world over have campaigned vigorously to get rid of these nuclear weapons, but generally to no avail until just recently, on July 7th of this, this past July 7th, 122 nations stood up to the world superpowers and adopted a land agreement for a uh, historic treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. While the nuclear nations are not among the nations who support the treaty, the hope is that this treaty will strengthen the global norm against the use and possession of these weapons that it will establish a powerful new international legal standard, one that stigmatizes nuclear weapons and compels nations to take steps toward disarmament. The United States, which could have used its power to help to end the peril that nuclear weapons pose to the world, chose instead to boycott the negotiations and worked to persuade approximately 40 other countries, including our neighbor Canada, and most of the NATO states to join the boycott. Nuclear weapons are the only weapon of mass destruction not yet prohibited under international law. Despite their imminent danger and their inhumane and indiscriminate nature, there are approximately 15,000 nuclear warheads in the world held by nine nations, the US, Russia, UK, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. 90% are held by the US and Russia. So they have a lot of power, you know, to put a stop to this. But at this time, all nine of these countries, the nuclear states, are currently planning to upgrade and modernize their nuclear weapons arsenals. The US alone is planning to spend a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars, for redesigning nuclear warheads, this would be over a period of 30 years, I believe, as well as new nuclear bombers, submarines, land-based missiles, 
weapons labs, and production plants. In addition to the outrageous cost and the fact that the U.S. can already destroy the world many times over, this nuclear modernization plan violates the terms of the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires that nuclear powers engage in nuclear disarmament. It's not always easy to talk to people who believe in nuclear deterrence or the need for a strong military, but talk we must. And I want to touch briefly on some arguments for nuclear uh, abolition. First, the abolition of nuclear weapons is an urgent humanitarian necessity. There is no effective humanitarian response, no meaningful health response to the use of nuclear weapons. They are unique in their destructive power, in the unspeakable human suffering they cause, and in the threat they cause pose to the environment, to future generations, and indeed to the survival of humanity. Any weapons, any use of these weapons should be considered illegal and immoral. The second issue of security, and this is the one that people will most often bring up. In fact, it's interesting to note that most of the countries that did not, for the, did not vote for the treaty said nuclear weapons were essential for their security. Nuclear weapons, in fact, make us less safe. Rather than keeping peace, they breed fear and mistrust among nations. And these weapons are useless in addressing today's real security threats, such as terrorism, climate change, extreme poverty, overpopulation, and disease. And there have been many documented incidents of near use of, weapon, of nuclear weapons as a result of a miscalculation or accident, including times when the decision to launch was seconds from happening. Unless we eliminate nuclear weapons, they will almost certainly be used again, either intentionally or by accident, and the consequences will be catastrophic. If you'd really like a good scare, I recommend you read Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control, which talks about, I think he says there's a thousand incidents where something could have happened which would have been disastrous, either an accident or a near use of nuclear weapons. Third is the danger to the environment. Nuclear weapons are the only device ever created to have the capacity to destroy all life on Earth. According to studies by Physicians for Social Responsibility, the use of even a, per, a fraction of current arsenals would cause catastrophic climate disruption, a devastating agricultural collapse, and a global famine that could kill more than two billion people. And as climate change progresses, the danger of nuclear war will increase dramatically as nations experience limited food and limited water resources and try to deal with forced migration that could dwarf the current refugee crisis. And you know what a serious problem the current refugee crisis is. Fourth is economic. Nuclear weapons programs divert public funds from health care, education, infrastructure repair, disaster relief, and other vital human services. The nine nuclear nations spent tens of billions of dollars <clears throat> each year to maintain and modernize their arsenals. Where will the one trillion dollars that the U.S. is planning to spend come from? We know where it'll come from. Right now they're saying, you know, for the 56 billion that the president wants, they're going to take it from Social Security mm -hmm. and Medicare. So they're going to be very responsible and make sure they can pay for these things but they're taking them from the very programs which are most likely to bring about peace. The treaty agreed to on July 7th of 217, just one month ago, prohibits nations from developing, testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, possessing, stockpiling, using, or threatening to use nuclear weapons under any circumstances. It also make it, makes it illegal to assist, encourage, or induce anyone to engage in any activities prohibited under the treaty. In addition, nations must not allow nuclear weapons to be stationed or deployed on their territory. A nation, such as the United States or any other nuclear state, 
uh, one that possesses nuclear weapons can join the treaty, but it has to remove all their weapons from operational status immediately. This would be really scary for our government, wouldn't it? Um, and destroy them in accordance with a legally binding time-bound plan. It would also be required to eliminate its entire nuclear program. A nation such as Germany that hosts U.S. nuclear weapons on its territory can join the treaty so long as it re agrees to remove them by a specified deadline. The treaty also addresses reparations for victims of nuclear use and testing and for environmental damage caused by such weapons. So it's a great treaty. The treaty will be open for official signing by all members of the UN and others on September 20th of this year and will take effect 90 days after the 50th nation has ratified, signed, or accepted it. It will be legally binding only on those nations that sign it. Signing the treaty is a relative simple uh, act. It's performed by the executive branch of a government. Ratifying a treaty generally involves a legislative process. In the U.S., the Senate would be the body that would ratify the treaty. If you want more specific information, you can find a copy of the treaty, a very helpful Q&A, and a lot of other good information on the website of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. ICAN, R-C-A-N. Just Google it and it pops right up there. As citizens of this country, the only country that has used nuclear weapons, and the country that spends more on its nuclear arsenal than all other countries combined, have a special responsibility to speak out to ensure that these weapons are never again used by our government. The WAM campaign to ban nuclear weapons grew out of this, camp, uh, out of this conviction. The day the treaty was signed, the U.S. issued a statement that said, we do not intend to sign, ratify, or ever become a party to it. Same day, came, came right out there. So where do we start? We gotta start at the grassroots, and that's where the WAM campaign starts. Our long-term goals are to stop the trillion dollar modernization of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, to get the U.S. to take nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert, that the U.S. ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and the U.S. president vows no first use of nuclear weapons. Very ambitious goals indeed, and, and also long-term. Our short-term goals are more doable, and this is where we would like your help. One Minnesota U.S. senator and three Minnesota U.S. House members will publicly support the treaty. Our hope lies with Senator Franken and House members Keith Ellison, Tim Walz, and Rick Nolan. We want to send 2,000 postcards to Senator Franken and, Franken and Klobuchar, which read, sorry, what did I do with that card? Well, I don't necessarily have to read it. I guess you can look at it yourself. But basically, it asks them <coughs> to, to um, publicly support the treaty, and in the meantime, to stop the trillion dollar modernization, to take weapons off hair trigger alert, and to ratify the comprehensive test ban treaty. Uh, we have printed 3,000 of these cards apiece for both Franken and for uh, Senator Klobuchar, and we believe that more than 1,200 over have already been sent in. And we don't, we try to only count those that we know are sent in. I myself send in 600 apiece, so I, you know, we know a lot. I mean, I've collected them from churches from various places. So we know we have a lot, uh, and I'm sure by October we will have more than 2,000 each. Uh, we want to gather, our goal was to gather 5,000 signatures on a petition demanding a ban on nuclear weapons. I know some of you signed it. It was going around the other day when I was here on Wednesday, I believe it was. Uh, which will go to the two Minnesota Senators and eight members of the House of Representatives. And they will be delivered to each of their offices in October. So we're still working on this. And we have actually, Steve knows better than I do, but I think we have about 60, 5,600 right now. 54 plus. Yeah, because I, I knew the 54 was a few days back and we collected some more. So uh, we've moved our goal to 10,000 by October. So we need some help. 10,000 leaks. We want to reach out to local churches, encourage them to get, encourage them to get signatures on postcards and petitions, which we have done quite a bit of, and to take other creative actions, whatever they think they can do within their communities. We always try the 
we we'll always try them to talk about what they can do, what they think they can do, so that the, the power comes from them rather than an outside group coming in and telling them what to do. We want to engage 100 new people in act actively promoting the campaign, which I think we're, we're getting up there. And we want the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul, who are members of Mayors for Peace, to publicly support the tree. And by the way, there's no reason why any of you can't go to your city mayor, educate him about the treaty, and say, we want you to speak out publicly about this treaty, and talk about all the money, and you can look this up, all the money our taxpayers and our community pay in order to support this nuclear, this nuclear arsenal. And um, in closing, I want to say, we're always looking for people willing to get signatures on postcards and petitions and to visit our local officials. We, we have a couple uh, dates set up, so if you're interested in visiting either Franklin or Klobuchar, come and see me and I'll talk to you about the dates we're going to see them. We are especially interested in getting more signatures on petitions from outstate Minnesota. This is a copy of the petition. There's 20, uh, 20 people can sign the petition. And if people from outstate would take one or two of these and get 20 or 40 signatures, that would be really helpful. We have probably 3,000 of the 5,400 are from the metropolitan area. So we need more people from out state when we go to Nolan and, and go up to Peterson in his area. We need people from that area of the state. Uh, anyway, you can pick them up later and maybe question after everybody talks. I think that's where it's supposed to be. Are right? you saying out state or out city? What? Out state, like Wisconsin, or out of city? No. Out state, in Minnesota, because this okay. is for Minnesota. Oh, now, in the outer now part I of the have state. A in copy Minnesota. of our campaign. I have a copy, a copy of our campaign. If anyone from like Wisconsin or anyone else say, hey, let me take a look at that and see what you're doing, I do have a, an overview. So anyway, come and see me later if you're interested in helping. Thank you very much. That was terrific, and we we keep rolling along. We will have time for questions and answers. Uh, this is very well, specific, though, to what you want us to do. Or not. Both the cards <laughs> and the, so should one person sign this as well as sign a card? Yes, but we're more in the outstate. We really want to get, okay. okay but, but yes, we have the cards. So it's okay to do both. Great cards. Okay. Okay. Yes, doing both is yeah. good. Okay. And you can pick them up and take them. And but we, we're going to try our very best to have a good question and answer session if we if we get through yeah, this. So Bonnie Erfer uh, attended Milwaukee Public Schools during the duck and cover days uh -huh. when the government never lied to us, and the possibility of nuclear war never left her mind. Her heart led her to the path of peace and justice work for 28 years until retirement, and now as a volunteer, she has worked for Nuke Watch. During those years, she has become educated about the nuclear industry, as few others have. She organized, marched, crossed lines, wrote, spent six and a half years in jails and prisons, tracked H-bomb trucks and trains, created the maps in nuclear heartland, painted banners, and participated in all sorts of mischief at military bases, nuclear missile silos, and war machine sites. She now lives in community outside of Luck, Wisconsin, with her favorite organization only 200 steps away. Bonnie Erfer. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <sighs> well, not everyone you meet invites you to get arrested, but in the name of peace, nuclear disarmament and reactor shutdowns, that's exactly what I'm doing. Actually, you can consider this a 10 minute commercial for challenging the nuclear establishment in court and on the line. There's no harm in nonviolent resistance. I have been arrested, I swear, fewer than 100 times <laughs> over the past 30 years to draw attention to the deadly nuclear industry and the senseless ongoing war. I encourage you to do the same as the U.S. nuclear arsenal daily threatens everyone on planet Earth. The nuclear industry is responsible for vast amounts of contaminated air, sea, and land in areas called dead zones on our own soil. Pick a copy of the 
quarterly, right here. And that will help to encourage you and get you in the mood for action. I know you can and do write letters, sign petitions, pass out literature, call into radio programs, write songs, do dances, create art and videos to further the cause of peace and justice. I know you plaster your cars with bumper stickers. You may belong to an organization that purchased a billboard for peace, painted a mural, and had a discussion I'll about community back. justice. Fine. Perhaps you've joined a march or a vigil, organized a run for freedom. You may even have recycled your TV. There are so many things to do to create change. Buy responsibly, picket, strike, divest from harmful industries, why, you could refuse to pay war taxes, help blockade the entrance of a harmful industry, and a weapons manufacturer sit in a tree to prevent clear cutting and save old growth forests, occupy a nuclear missile silo, even do a citizen's arrest of the president. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> <laughs> My dream is that one day we'll be so huge we'll be able to walk up to the White House and just ask for the keys. But that is going to take a lot of help from a lot of people and people willing to take the next bold step. In the meantime, our water is being poisoned, food supply altered, people tortured, and everyone today and into the future radioactively contaminated. And we drive, 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 you know the story, each of us re is responsible for environmental destruction. For almost three decades, I resisted the nuclear industry and the war system, and I know that what I do is not enough. I know that we are not enough. And I know that this is no time to stop. As people have turned their focus to climate change, the reality of nuclear war and the danger of nuclear reactors have been minimized in the media and industry. Don't believe the nuclear utilities that say nuclear power is green or, more importantly, safe. Don't. When it comes to nuclear weapons, the law is on our side, not just because of the new treaty coming about, but the Nuremberg Principles, the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Convention, the International Court of Justice at the Hague, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the UN General Assembly Resolutions, humanitarian law, Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, Constitution making treaties part of the supreme law of the land, the Fifth Commandment via God, the Golden Rule, <laughs> Sam Day, my mentor, and I all agree that the mere possession of nuclear weapons is immoral, illegal, and a crime against humanity. <laughs> our, situation, our situation is serious, and weapons make it grave. The flight to impact time for your average nuclear weapon is 12 minutes. That's it. That's, and, and what if it's a computer accident? It doesn't matter. The fact that nuclear weapons sit on hair trigger alert deserves nonviolent, direct, civil disobe disobedience and resistance and more. And the more people we are, the more change can happen. The nuclear freeze movement of the 80s would not have been complete or as effective without nonviolent civil disobedience. Greenham Common and the Seneca Women's Peace Camp were part of an influential bunch of people, as were the thousands and thousands of people crossing the line in Nevada to oppose above-ground nuclear testing. The list of dynamic campaigns is long. Plowshares disarmament actions have been outstanding, outrageous, and necessary examples of citizen actions in our defense. More than 100 times individuals have physically trespassed to physically disarm parts of the nuclear weapons delivery system or the raw weapons. Thanks go to committed activists at locations such as Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, Savannah River, Georgia, in Georgia, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and peace groups at dozens of other nuclear weapons sites for continuing the work forward. Join these committed and courageous people and organizations. Support and read the nuclear resistor. Call before midnight tonight. Nonviolent resistance has worked. Plus, think of the assets to getting arrested. It's a whole new experience. You meet people you would never have the chance to otherwise meet, come face to face with our soldiers, their guns and tanks, 
Need the police? Get a ride in the police car. Go to court. Be silenced. Be found guilty. Get another ride. Go to jail. Have your picture taken. Wear ugly clothes and used but clean underwear. Watch TV all day. Play cards. Live in solidarity with the poor. Meet more new people and celebrate the day like never before when you get out. Getting out of jail feels so good <laughs> that really it's worth going in. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and I can guarantee for artists, it's the best studio time ever, even if toilet paper is your only resource. <laughs> Furthermore, the jails and prisons deserve us. Who else has the opportunity to speak for the millions and millions of imprisoned people? People in jails are hungry in, in, hungry in way overcrowded conditions. The food can be rotten enough to make people sick. Rehabilitation is an illusion fed to the people outside. There is so much work to be done in the jails and prisons. I've been asked if civil disobedience or resistance works. I don't know. I know it can't hurt, and I'm a firm believer in trying everything. At home, we call a life of resistance a life of high adventure. It's waiting for you, too. <laughs> Helen Woodson, an anti-nuclear activist retired, once said, how much is too much to give for, your, the, for the lives of your children? And that's, I think, the ultimate question. How much is too much to give? Okay, but I have one more really important show and tell that is the final encouragement to get arrested. Here we have maximum security and antiperspirant deodorant. The only place you can get <laughs> is in jail or prison. And then it's just by luck. Maybe you get this, maybe you don't. <laughs> but, you know, it's got to be worth it. <laughs> okay, that's the end of my 10 minute commercial on do what you can, get a rest, take another step. <laughs> Everybody bring a bottle of that to DC. Let's we'll see what we can clean up. Uh, Ellen Thomas is a member of the Coordinating Committee of World Beyond War. She's a co-chair of the Disarm and Wars Committee of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. section. She lives in the mountains of North Carolina. She spent 25 years in Washington, D.C., 18 of them maintaining a day and night vigil for global disarmament in front of the White House. With her husband, Vigil founder William Thomas, she co-founded the Peace House 10 blocks from the Vigil, which she managed from 2002 until his death in 2009. Thomas travels quite a bit to promote a bill in the U.S. Congress that has been introduced every session since 1994 after a successful voter initiative that Thomas and other Vigilers brought in Washington, D.C. You can learn more at prop1.org, P-R-O-P, numeral one. Org for a history of the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. Uh, see also the, the text and write a letter to your congressperson asking for co-sponsorship. There's supposed to be a link here to a page on rootsaction.org. Uh, Thomas has been collecting information about nuclear issues and since December 1998, posting what she has learned on Yahoo at Nuke News. She is a videographer with an amazing library of events since the mid-1980s and most recently has been moderating the Facebook pages Nuke News and Eye on Congress, <coughs> among others, and even more recently videoing uh, this convention. So, yes. uh, Ellen Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that was my speech. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you, when I went to jail in 1980 for camping in front of the White House in like three months, uh, when they took me through the, the all that, checking out all your cavities and everything, then they issued me a double blade safety razor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in prison. A, a double blade safety razor. I don't know if they still do that, but I was pretty surprised by that. So
so um, I love the title of this um, talk today, this, this workshop, Ending the Nuclear Nightmare. Um, as Marie has so well laid out, uh, it's definitely got to be done. And I'd like to announce that Women's International League for Peace and Freedom has, um, has taken on a project which we call Let's End the Whole Nuclear Era Everywhere. And I'm going to yeah. yeah, you want to? Thank you. Um, and we are, and I, oh, I need one of those so I can go through it with you. Um, and just last week, we were in um, Chicago at our triennial. Every three years, we have a Congress. And at that Congress, we decided to really focus our attention on doing something similar to what you're doing, only on a nationwide mm -hmm. level. And that is a petition to the US President and Senate asking them to, um, I call upon the President to sign and the Senate to give its consent to ratify this treaty. In addition, I call upon you to safely and speedily remove all U.S. nuclear weapons from all foreign sites, wherever they are stationed or deployed. And further, I call on you to lead the way to negotiate the total elimination of nuclear weapons and to redirect current and planned nuclear weapons spending to human and environmental needs. Um, it goes into, uh, there's a paragraph about nuclear weapons in the treaty, which we've already heard about. And we are hoping, we're, we're going to be putting this up on Roots Action, hopefully today. And uh, I want to get it on change.org and every other site that imaginable um, to try to get people interested in signing this petition. And we want to let the United Nations know that people in the United States are working on this. And we hope we spoke about this, and we would really love it if, if WAM would <coughs> join your petitions with ours, and we can do some kind of a symbolic delivery to the United Nations. We're thinking perhaps uh, United Nations Day, October 21st. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and Leah Bolger over there has been involved in the, in the discussions on this and uh, is a wonderful WILF member. Um, for the last two years, I've been going on a, a nuclear free future tour of the United States, visiting Wilf, Women, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, is also known as WILF, visiting the WILF branches around the country and talking about this campaign uh, and and what this means. Um, and while I was on the road, I started learning about just what are the effects of the nuclear weapons uh, programs. And, you know, the $1.4 trillion that, they, that President Trump wants to invest in modernizing the nuclear weapons program goes on top of 60 years of nuclear weapons uh, I mean, nuclear power and nuclear waste, uh, which lead to nuclear weapons. Um, and the, the waste has been getting into the soil and the air and the water all over the country. And there's no money for cleanup. And they keep continuing to um, say that we can, you know, this power plant, oh, it's due to uh, be shut down now? No, let's give it another 20 years. And there were a couple of sites that I actually visited on, on tour this year that uh, really affected me, and I wanted to tell you about them and, and see if there can't be some way to try to do something about them. One is um, in St. Louis, Missouri. There is still um, radioactive material from the Manhattan Project that is at, is at the landfill, the West Lake landfill, which is on the edge of the river there. Mm -hmm. And for several years now, there has been an underground fire that they can't put out, and it's headed towards this nuclear waste. And there's a community that was built up around this landfill many years ago, people that weren't told that there was radioactive waste in there. Um, and the people want to move, but they can't sell their houses to somebody because they don't want to give their problem to somebody else. 
and money is just not available to help them get out of there. And also money so it doesn't seem to be available to help stop the fire and, and do something about getting rid of that waste either because we're spending the money on the military and on new weapons. Uh, another place uh, similar to that is a beautiful little town in um, the mountains of Tennessee called Irwin. And it's on the Nolichucky River and there's these hills and then there's this little stream going through it and there's houses along there and then there's this great big plant. And at this great big plant they've been making fuel rods for our nuclear navy. And also <coughs> they've been taking the fuel rods back that no longer are as um, functional to reprocess and then make new fuel rods. And in the reprocessing they're producing plutonium and highly enriched uranium. And they have all sorts of other chemicals which I wish that my brain could manage to hang on to all this stuff, but it just doesn't seem to want to do that. But believe me, it's very toxic. And a, a woman who is a member of WILF now, um, Linda Modica, who used to work for the IRS as an investigator of corporate deductions, so she's a good researcher. She uh, moved to that area and she started hearing about people having cancers. And uh, she, she got in touch with a scientist um, who would work with her. And they started going down the Nolichucky River 90 miles, um, pounding galvanized pipes into the sediment and then pulling it out, shipping it off to labs and getting the reports back. And in, in every one of those reports, uh, there was terrible stuff. There was radioactive and other toxic materials. And all the way down to Douglas Lake. My mother's name was Douglas, so I'm really annoyed by that. <laughs> and, um, and so Linda, uh, she put on gloves while she was working with this, but she didn't put anything on her arms. And within a couple of years, she had melanoma on both arms. And, uh, and she had stomach cancer, and she went through several years of, of serious uh, treatments because she's back. She, we didn't see her for a while. She didn't tell anybody, but now that she's feeling better, uh, she's back. And um, so they started doing some, some other work. They went and knocked on doors uh, in the town. In one street, there were 43 houses. And, um, asked people about their health, and they found out that out of those 43 houses, there were 28 of them that had people who had either died of cancer or were struggling with cancer right then. There, there was a school just right around the corner from this toxic place, and, uh, you know, an elementary school, and one day a sinkhole mm -hmm. happened in the playground, and they closed the, st the school temporarily, um, and I guess they must have tested the sinkhole because then the school was closed permanently and the kids are being shipped off someplace else. And um, during Gregory Jasko's um, time in, in the um, DOE, was it the, the NRC, right? I can't ever remember the, those. Anyway, he was the head of, of, of one of those agencies, and he was going to do a, a, a formal cancer study, but then somebody said that he wasn't a nice guy and he had to quit, and so uh, they not only canceled the cancer study, but they extended the life of nuclear fuel services <coughs> plant for another 25 years. So those people in Irwin, Tennessee are basically written off as expendable. And this, these are just examples of many places, you know. This, um, Aiken, South Carolina, at, and across the river, Augusta, Georgia, where the Savannah Riverside is, that's been, they're, they're just shipping waste from all over the place to, to, the, to that area, and the Savannah River is terribly polluted, and it's a beautiful river, and it's such a shame. <coughs> Our water is so important to us. What are they doing to us? And when are they going to stop, and when are we going to stop them, and how are we going to stop them? Now, right now, there are shipments of highly radioactive liquid waste being transported from Chalk River, Canada, to the Savannah River site. Um, back in 1970, 
um, there was discussion about, there, there were some rules laid out about what was acceptable in terms of transporting nuclear waste. And they spoke about solid waste, but when it came to liquid waste, it was supposed to be kept on site. That is just too dangerous, it, because solid waste you can pick up and move, but liquid waste gets into the environment. Well, now they're shipping uh, 150 large canisters of highly radioactive waste, and who knows what could happen. I, I live near I-85, and there was a, a truck accident just a couple of months ago mm -hmm. where two semis oh, yeah. crashed into each other and, and caught on fire. There's accidents, and driving, I've been doing a lot of driving the last few years, and it's not like it used to be. There's so many people now, <laughs> and they go so fast, and they have <laughs> such big vehicles, you know? It's, and, the, and the infrastructure, of course, is, is failing because we're not investing in the infrastructure. We're investing in the weapons and the wars. They are. Excuse me. We are. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, if we're paying taxes, we are. That, I, I agree that uh, not, not paying taxes is a good thing to do. So um, David mentioned that Eleanor Holmes Norton of Washington, D.C. has been introducing a bill into Congress every session, um, up until last session, called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. She hasn't introduced it this session, and I think it's because of the new nuclear weapons ban treaty. <coughs> and so we're going to be rewriting that bill so that it reflects what's going on right now and see if she will, um, will introduce it. But we do have this uh, treaty for the Senate, and that is for the House. And uh, I'd like to go over that with you, except I don't have it in front of me here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. It says, the U.S. government shall provide leadership to negotiate and enter into a multilateral treaty um, for the dismantlement and elimination of all nuclear weapons in every country under strict and effective international control and redirect resources that are being used for nuclear weapons and converting all nuclear weapons industries to smoothly to constructive, ecologically beneficial peacetime activities, including strict control of fissile materials and radioactive waste and in addressing human and infrastructure needs, including development and deployment of sustainable, carbon-free, and nuclear-free energy sources, <coughs> health care, housing, education, agriculture, and environmental restoration, including long-term radioactive waste monitoring. There's a, ter there's a clause here that seems to be the one that gets in the way, and I, we're, I'm, we're thinking about whether we should keep it, and your thoughts on that would be great, but I'm sure that you would want, like to keep it, and that's undertake <coughs> vigorous, good-faith efforts to eliminate war, armed conflict in all military operations, and actively promote policies to induce all other countries to join in these commitments. And um, we've gotten co-sponsors over the years, but we need a lot more. This year, uh, Jan Schakowsky of Chicago, uh, Raul Grahal of, of Arizona, and John Lewis of, um, of Atlanta, Georgia, have all said that they would co-sponsor the bill when, when Norton reintroduces it, and we need more co-sponsors. We, we also um, want to support Representative Raul Grijalva in introducing the uranium mining moratorium and cleanup bill that he has been negotiating with um, some members of the uh, Lakota, uh, the, the, um, the, I, I don't know which tribe it is. No, but, but, no it's the Lakota, I believe it's two, yeah. Um, Charmaine Whiteface uh, is of uh, Defenders of the Black Hills is a member of WILP, and she's been a leader in in that, and is quite eloquent about it. And and Grahava said that he would introduce it, but he hasn't done it yet. And so we need to put some pressure on him or uh, encourage him to do it. I think and he's a good guy. So, but I don't know why he hasn't introduced it. Um, and then. We should support Senator Markey and Representative Lou's Restricting First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act. 
uh, because just because we want to make sure that Mr. Trump and his successors can't can't use can't go ahead and drop a bomb without permission of Congress. But that doesn't go nearly far enough. We really, really have to push the nuclear weapons ban treaty and insist that our government sign on to this treaty and do it rapidly. Set an example. Be you know, we've been we've set an example of being the bad guy. Let's 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 be the good guy for a change. Very well said by all three of you. Uh, any Questions? Yes, go ahead. I have a question for the last speaker. You mentioned Chalk River, and I have a personal family connection with that because my father worked at the Chalk River plant from 1945 to 49. Chalk River was Canada's first nuclear reactor, and uh, his job was over when I finally got it online, and he never knew that it subsequently became a source of plutonium for the U.S. weapons program. And I know there have been a couple of accidents there. I wondered if you could tell us more about the waste that came I don't know. To your uh, all I know is that it's liquid, highly radioactive liquid. waste, and the, and the Canada doesn't want it. I've heard a rumor that it has something to do, whatever it is, has something to do with making um, neutron bombs. I don't know if that's true. But, um, but it does seem a little fishy why they would want it. Why would, you know, there's, there, of course, Canada is paying the Savannah River site to take it, and it might just be money, but I think it's more than that. I think it has something on you know, national security or something that they're using. As, as I, think, I think it's that uh, the waste is plutonium contaminated, so as long as there's plutonium, then that is a uh, potential for nuclear material. So it would just have to be dried out and collect your plutonium and make yourself a nuclear bomb. The United States government has always wanted everybody's plutonium because then that's why the, U the United States so connected reactors with weapons is that reactors were encouraged because we wanted the used fuel rods to get the the plutonium out to make more nuclear bombs. So you can't separate reactors from <coughs> the bomb, the bomb stream. They are one and the same. Now that we have an abundance of tritium and we have an abundance of plutonium, we really don't want it anymore. And the United States broke all of the contracts with the utilities, the nuclear utilities, saying once upon a time, we will take your fuel rods. They cut that off aren't taking them, the utilities are suing and taxpayers are having to pay to cover the cost of, of safeguarding all of these fuel rods at reactor sites because there's no place to put them. And the U.S. doesn't want to do separation anymore because we have plenty of plutonium, but it's still extremely dangerous and can make its way into the weapons stream. So, so one, two, Three and then four be back there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if any of you know about the Clinton deal with selling uranium. I'm wondering if you can talk to the new cold are they called cold fusion reactors that Hansen, the famous uh, global warming person, is advocating for. Many people now in the green movement are advocating for cold fusion reactors, if that's the name of them. And then I'd like to know if the Army is still using depleted uranium in its weapons. The last one's yes. Anybody want to speak to any of those? Um, I, I can't, I don't know much about the cold fusion stuff, the reactor stuff, except to say that no reactor technology has been uh, acceptably safe. Or, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind you're talking about, it's just a failed technology. I just read the other day that the cost of solar and renewables is far out, is far surpassing, no, nuclear far surpasses the cost of renewables. Now, there's no reason for nuclear anything. Because you can get solar panels cheaper, you can build a dam cheaper, you can do a turbine cheaper. 
than nuclear. So I'd say nuclear is dead. And you may have just noticed in the uh, paper just a couple days ago that the two nuclear plants that they were going to build, I believe it was one of the Carolinas, yeah, that so they it. are no longer building it because they can't afford to build it, and the taxpayers now are stuck with this. Oh, yeah. Many, For 60 many, years. Many millions years. of many dollars years. that they have spent yeah. to get these up and running, and they can't do it anymore. And the way they pay for, for these plants is, uh, we call it construction work and process, or quip, and, it, and they, they charge the um, ratepayers up front to build these plants. And mm. a lot of the older people will never even get the benefit from mm. The only one that's still being constructed now, actively constructed, is uh, at, at uh, uh, Bogle in, uh, in, August, in Augusta, Augusta, across the river from, the, from the Savannah River site. They've already got the reactor, but they're building another one. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, number two. Oh, thank you. I'm, so I I'm very much appreciate all, all, everything you all are doing and sharing with us, and I agree, agree, agree with it all. However, I'm interested in your informed thinking about the following. I think our current situation right now in this world is extremely scary because of two men who uh, seems like don't have any understanding of what would happen if they were to use nuclear weapons. And you know who the two men are that I'm talking about that have their fingers on the trigger. One that, uh, that some in this country call our president, and the other a guy over in North Korea. And uh, it just seems scary as hell right now about these two very unpredictable men who have a great deal of power and I'm just wondering, should we be focusing our time and effort on really raising a lot more awareness about that scary situation? Well, well, I would just like to say, and I'm sure other people <coughs> probably know more about this than I do, but Mike Whitney has written an article called, The Problem is Washington, Not North Korea. The press has done such a hype on North Korea North Korea is not a danger to the United States. We are a danger to North Korea. We have surrounded um, China and Russia uh, with bases. We have, you know, we are the dangerous nuclear power in the world, or one of the most dangerous. And you know now that Russia it would really, I believe, want to negotiate. And actually, Trump is a little bit open. I mean, he seems open to this. And the press is just putting him down. Everything, every time Trump tries to kind of work with Trump, with uh, uh, Putin, I, you know, I don't necessarily trust yeah. Trump on anything. Uh, <laughs> but actually, this is good. This is not bad. This is good. And we are just so focused on Russia and the elections and everything that Russia is doing. As I said earlier, we have Russia surrounded with bases. Russia does not have anybody surrounded with bases, certainly not us. I mean, uh, you just have to look at what's really going on in the world. Thank you for saying that. You know, there was one nuclear country that voted to create this nuclear ban treaty, and it was, it was North, North Korea. Korea. Yeah. And when North Korea has made agreements with the United States in the 90s, for example, to halt its nuclear program, it's abided by those agreements. And, and when the United States has escalated the bringing in the weapons and the mock nuclear bombing runs and so forth. I mean, North Korea has reacted exactly predictably, yeah. perfectly predictably. I mean, unpredictable, I think, is the, is the least applicable adjective for you know, how North Korea responds to, to the United States. Number, th number three was, number three was way back in the back, uh, maybe he's not interested anymore. Oh, was that you? No. Okay, well, we'll go to number four. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my family's from Nagasaki, and I lost several relatives who I will never know because of the bomb. And they, they uh, well, whatever. But the, the, the real tragedy of the bomb is reflected in Nagasaki Museum, War Museum. If you have ever, and I've been there a few years ago, if you've ever been there and seen the destructiveness of the bomb on the human body, you, there's no question, even I think Trump might even be persuaded, 
if he saw the images and the destruction of, 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 of a bomb like that. It's just incredible. And uh, it's something that you, you never forget, you know, if you visited it. And I think that's the kind of imagery that you might want to want to publicize to to gain support, because it's just. And for me, of course, it's a very personal thing. But I think for anyone who sees it, it's going to be personal to them too. Anybody well, want to speak to that? Yeah, one point about that is that the Hiroshima bomb was 12.5 kilotons. We now have dial a yield nuclear weapons that can go up to 300 and I think 25. Yeah. The the magnitude is incomprehensible. So when you see the destructive power of just the 12.5, it's massive. It's huge, and we're talking about many times, hundreds of times more, with what we have in the reserves. Okay. In the second row, and then in the first row. Yeah. What, who puts out the, the atomic clock? What's the name of that organization that does the Bulletin atomic of the atomic scientists. Yes. I recently, uh, this was about three, four years ago. I heard the president of the, the organization out of the bulletin uh, spoke locally. <clears throat> and she said, there has never been any public discussion in this country, not a word in the congressional record, about the rules of engagement that, uh, regarding nuclear weapons. Every other weapon system we've had. Uh, public discussion about. Now, I imagine there might be dangers in pushing for such a public discussion, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether that's a, a wise idea to have such public discussion or encourage such public discussion, because we've never had it. Not, not one word in the nearly 75 years that we've had these weapons. Well, you know, we, we hear nothing about the treaty here. Have you seen it? Maybe some little <laughs> article that I missed, but we don't hear anything about the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We just don't discuss this stuff. It's like it's not important because the powers that be, and the newspapers go along with this, the powers that be do not support it, and so it just doesn't get any coverage. It doesn't get into the uh, human consciousness, and, and, and it's our job, really, to start publishing, publicizing this. And I, I you know, I think you're making a good point there. We need some discussion. Yeah, but what would rules of engagement be? I mean, you don't have a nuclear engagement and survive it. What, what, would, what would the rules well, be? Well, the rule would be no first, no use. You don't use uh, them. Yeah, right. That is number one. But I think that the other part of the no discussion on it is that there, it's indefensible. So there can't be a discussion. How do you discuss something that is so yeah. atrocious, so illegal, yeah. so immoral? Yeah. There can't be a discussion except to say shut them down. And it, look at your look at your insurance coverage. It says right on your insurance coverage that you will not be covered if you're destroyed by a nuclear bomb. <laughs> it's in there. You know, they're excluded. It's totally excluded even from something like that. How dare them? Oh, you get destroyed your, your house is burnt. Ah, oh, too bad. Oh, it was a nuclear bomb. No coverage. Jeez. <laughs> Well, that's automatic. So it's so indefe indefensible. <laughs> that's the understanding we have to get for all of war. Uh, Pat. Yeah. Yes. Um, I remember reading in 1981 an article by Erwin Knoll of the Progressive Magazine. And it was, the day the bomb blew up, imagine that it happened. And he, um, he painted the picture of a nuclear weapon, a 20 megaton bomb, blowing up over Chicago. <laughs> you remember that? And, and, and it was, it, you know, there, you know, it's an airliner and it's 20 miles out and it crashes and trees are on fire 20 miles away and, you know, things burst 30 miles away, that kind of thing. Did you see that? Nuts. I mean, I think it's powerful for, for, for the youth, you know, to be able to really get a handle on what these things will do, you know. And, and that you, you know, I, I wrote one for Washington and it was published in a couple little places, you know. Um, but imagine, you know, being able to do that for a bunch of different cities. You never heard of it, huh? No, but Helen Caldecott did the same thing in her books. Uh, each one of them has the devastating effect of a small bomb. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And there are some good videos uh, yeah. about that topic as well. So, one, two, three, four, there. Okay, we're first right here. Yeah. And, um, last fall, I helped supervise an exhibit in St. Paul on the 
uh, the atomic bombings going from the Manhattan Project through the bombings to the aftermath of the rebuilding of Japan. And I was hoping to educate people who came in, except over the course of three months, almost nobody came to the exhibit. Mm -hmm. We'd get in three hours in the afternoon, I'd get six, eight, ten people coming through. They did have some school groups in the morning, at least, so they could educate them. But it's just something that just doesn't seem to register with people. And you look at the six pictures immediately after the bombing, and they are really tough to look at those, those photos of what it did to the cities and the people there. And what was scary was that a lot of the people thought nuclear weapons were gone. Yeah. They, did, they thought we didn't have them anymore. Like somehow it just, they just kind of, you know, sort of faded away. And they sort of faded away in consciousness, maybe until these two guys are, are showing up in positions of power. But we have to do a lot of educating still. Yes. Uh, so, uh, what is the status of churches weighing in on this? Uh, have national church bodies uh, made statements against nuclear weapons, and what hope is there? Does that? Um, I'm not aware. I mean, you know, the Catholic Church has a, an encyclical on peace, but this is quite old. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the better things they did, though, that, that was, um, I don't know how many years ago, but a long time ago. Uh, but I think we just have to be working with the churches on a local basis. I have sent out letters to about 30 churches about what we're trying to do here and suggesting that they have nuclear roundtables and we'll provide the facilitators. And basically we say, um, what are your concerns about nuclear weapons? What do you think your church can do? And then we talk about the WAM campaign. And people are really interested. I mean, they are interested. It's just a matter, I think, of getting, although there are so many issues. I know one of the churches we went to said, I don't know if we can fit this onto our agenda. But they did agree to table for two Sundays. You know, to, um, but I think we just have to get out there. And, and, and we should be talking to our national group. And especially now that we have this treaty, let's get them yeah. on board in doing something about that. On the global level, though, I know religious organizations yeah. definitely participate in the ICANN, you know, the, the effort toward the treaty. Yeah. Leah, were you next? Yeah, I was. Um, two questions, uh, two comments. <coughs> One is, uh, it is so disgusting to hear people say things like nuke them all. Uh, it, you know, it, it's just, they have no concept what they're talking about. And the second thing is, is where I disagree a little bit about the Marky Lou bill by saying no first use. And we all agree it should be no use at all. If we use them second, it's all over. It's done. I mean, the whole world will be, you know. So, you know, I just I don't understand the point of saying uh, no first use. It just seems to me like you're 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 condoning second use if you do that. So I have a real problem with that bill. Or Congress has to approve. Then, if you want to speak that. Okay, Larry, you were next. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I sit here listening and my head just swirls and I get mixed up inside. Um, but, you know, where, where it started was before you said the property insurance says you're not covered for a nuclear explosion, it, it also says, and I, virtually no one knows this stuff, it, it says we're not covered in the event of a disaster at a nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, right. people don't know that... Uh, you know, the two work together, and I, I'm just wondering, you know, and then I get swept up in the, yeah, and why, why is it that nobody knows that the just, it's a just war, quote unquote, if no civilians are harmed? I mean, churches say that, just war, but, but has anybody ever seriously, uh, you know, tried to do anything with uh, the, the, you know, the hidden stuff about, from the beginning, nuclear power was so dangerous that private insurers wouldn't, you know, to just try to, or, or is that just, I, you know, I know, David, you're going to solve all of this in the prosecuting thing later, but. Uh, what, I, well, I think it's an important point that the wonderful capitalist free market won't touch nuclear energy, and uh, pseudo-environmentalists can cheer its praises, but, you know, the only people who will pay for it 
are taxpayers getting screwed by a government that doesn't tell them what it's yeah, doing? But, but has it's anybody doing. ever tried to go after that in any way at, at a higher level, whatever? I, I don't. I'm not aware of it. So. You mean the whole insurance question, or do you mean the well, nuclear energy? Well, just the issue? fact that that, uh, that, that that's reasons. how it all started. It was. I mean, it's like everything else, based on a really on a lie, uh, hiding the truth from people so that they don't know that. I mean, we should have not been doing it in the first place. Uh, which doesn't that make it illegal? And I know, you know, it's. I know everything is operating on that and. That's why I get, I get, I don't even want to talk about it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, just so you know that uh, in the New Watch Quarterly, in case you want more information on the treaty that's not being covered here in the media, front page story Woo! on the New Watch Quarterly about the treaty. So get one of these if you want to read about what's happening. The other thing is that I just returned from Germany not long ago addressing the U.S. nuclear weapons on their soil. They have 20 nuclear weapons ready to launch in Germany on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And um, it's totally unacceptable. The odd thing to me is that both the people in the United States and people in, journey, in Germany, 80% of the people in Germany do not want these U.S. nuclear weapons on their soil. How is it? that those numbers do not preside. Mm -hmm. How is it that those weapons are still there? Merkel apparently said, as a result of this treaty, that if 50 nations were willing to sign, they would have to reconsider the fact that US nuclear weapons are on their soil and sign this treaty. Well, 100 and what, 22? Guaranteed. Right, so, right, it's guaranteed. So that's forcing Germany to look at their position with US nuclear weapons. Germany says, well, we don't really want to get rid of the weapons because that's our security and we really like the protection of NATO. So how do we address this power, you know, this megalithic, faceless, nameless notion that nuclear weapons are necessary when 80% of the people of the country don't want it? It's crazy. Absolutely and when, when you mention NATO, a lot of people don't realize either that NATO, it's very hard for NATO countries to sign on to this and remain mm -hmm. in NATO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that exactly. becomes an issue because NATO supports the and they support first mm -hmm. Bonnie, could you, did you did say you something start? about your action briefly? Oh, in Germany? Yes. Well, there were a whole bunch of them actually. But um, I was really happy to go to Germany and do multiple actions, and here I am. I didn't get arrested. I didn't get a, put, get a hood put over my head. I didn't get handcuffed. I didn't get thrown on the ground and had to lay in the cold for four hours. I didn't see a police station. I, you know, they took our picture and probably were the most shocked when John LaForge had black magic marker on him and they had to take his picture with his black magic marker. That's how threatened they were by us. Um, the <laughs> bottom line is that, is that it was so unbelievably safe to do resistance in Germany. I'm thinking about moving to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> because we went in the dead of night, cut through four different fences, including two uh, security <laughs> fences surrounding the nuclear weapons bunkers. We climbed on top of a bunker, which is probably twice the height of this room, scrambled up there. And so we knew that there were probably five nuclear weapons beneath us on this bunker. And we had an astronomy lesson from somebody who was with us. It was a beautiful, clear night. There's no security. No lights went on. No alarms went off. Nobody is protecting these weapons from anybody. There's no security. There's no security around these weapons. And so we eventually announced ourselves. Otherwise, we would have frozen to death. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve Baggerly from Virginia Steve Baggerly, was, yes. Yeah, made and, enough noise to like... Uh, well, John and Steve went down and scratched into the front door, and when they were scratching into the front door was when they heard the little sound of the camera going... Rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> so then they came back up and said, we set off an alarm. And then that's when the security patrols came. But we were on the bunker. 
And no, if they had not gone down to that particular spot, nobody would ever, we would still be on top of the bunker. And just no security. So five minutes left. That's any, scary too. Any important questions we haven't gotten in? We have five minutes left. Uh, last question. Okay, here we go. So, so David, David, you're probably going to mention 7.30 tomorrow morning, so I'll let you cover that, but I want to mention for anyone here in the Twin Cities uh, that uh, tomorrow morning is uh, uh, re remembering Hiroshima. And then Tuesday evening at the Labyrinth in Como Park, for those who live in the area, uh, will be uh, uh, remembering Nagasaki. Which is a sister city to St. Paul. And there are flyers for that on the map table out in the exhibit area. And I also have some flyers on that. Yeah, talk to talk to your local Vets for Peace guys about getting rides and info, but it's in your program. Uh, there's a tea ceremony uh, this evening uh, at, from 6 to 8, and there is a Hiroshima Nagasaki commemoration tomorrow morning, 7.30 to 8.30. <laughs> it's a very well, sweet Well, as the, as the keynote speaker who's going to mention Nagasaki and <laughs> looking at the that's, program that's that says that's Nagasaki. That's Nagasaki. That's but, um, but, but anyway, and David is speaking tomorrow morning, right? Uh, right. At the uh, Hiroshima. At Come just for the garden. The garden itself is worth a visit. Let's try to go one at a time very fast. Mary? Um, I have to run a ride board if you need a ride tomorrow morning to go to the event, carpooling. Great. And also, please sign on our petition at World Beyond War if you're agreed to end all war. If you haven't signed it already, I passed around the sheet. And we're having a war and the environment conference in September. Uh, 22nd to 24th, since the military is the number one polluter. Washington. Including a lot about nukes. Uh, yeah. Do you want to say something, any of you, Marie? I just want to remind people to come pick up the literature if you're willing to do anything on the petition uh, or, and get the card signed. And I, on the new watch is a great source of information. And if you want, you can try some of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers.